it's them crazy things that you just cannot predict to happen. You could one minute be washing in a waterfall and before you know it, somebody's pulled you into their home. They've taken you up to the top of a mountain. They've brought you into their parents' house to have dinner, which might be a plate of insects and stewed fish curry and pig's hearts and then you'll yeah it's these unexpected things like a day can change in 30 minutes 10 minutes it's just you never know what's going to happen the next day and welcome back to the pursuit zone i'm paul schmid the host of this podcast that interviews explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories these are people that dream big break out of their comfort zones and take on ambitious pursuits This is episode 181 with Adam Hugill. We talk for the first hour about his experience cycling through Asia, and then we talk about his experience running and creating content for his YouTube channel. Let's start the show, and let me introduce my guest. The cycling books he read fueled his passion for travel and adventure. The mountains of South America, the deserts of Africa, the freezing tundra of Siberia, became the backdrop of his daydreams. In 2018, after 12 years in the British Army, he left that life behind to begin cycling to these faraway places. Since then, his desire to tell his story through video has grown, and he's steadily improving his filmmaking craft as he cycles his way around the world. You can learn more at his website, adamhugill.com, and at his YouTube channel, Adam Hugill, Cycling the World. Adam Hugill, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Hello there. Thanks for having me, Paul. So, Adam, before you started this big cycling tour, what was your life like? Before I started traveling by bike, I was in the British Army. So I'd spent 12 years in total, so four years as a reservist and then eight years full-time as an Army officer. But immediately before I did this i lived in cyprus which is a pretty small country in the mediterranean in europe and i pretty much spent like maybe 90 percent of my time sat behind a desk which is often the way with say like the military the longer you spend in the job the more desk bound you became so that's that was pretty much what my life looked like just before i started why did you want to go on this big cycle tour it all started i'd say five six years ago now i was based in afghanistan and I read a book by which many other cycle tourists have done before me by Alistair Humphreys. I was in this really rubbish place, very little freedom. And I'm reading a book about a guy that's got exactly the opposite to me, seemingly, who's pretty young and he's cycling around the world. And that was the, like, the trigger of the inspiration. And then from there, as soon as I like, returned from Afghanistan, I bought a bicycle And it was like, right, I'm going to go on my first bike tour and went away for 10 days in Europe. And from there, that was it. I was hooked. So that was kind of really what led to me doing this now, this big, big one that I'm doing. At the time, you're so you were married when you started out. Are are you still married? Uh, Yeah. So we are now separated. So, yeah, me and my wife of my former wife, we were married for six years and yeah, we started this journey together, pretty much, the bike tour. So she was with me through most of my military career, and we yeah, set off on the journey together. And about six months into it, we we realized after after being together for six months that what she wanted for her future was like vastly different to what I wanted. So on on pretty good terms, we yeah, we decided to go our separate ways and she's returned to England and I've continued on my journey. So yeah, we still we're still in a, a good place, but it was quite, yeah, I think maybe it took a big old risk of going on a, an adventure for us to work out really who we really are. I'm curious about at the time when you were planning this adventure, was it a difficult task to convince her to go along with you? Yeah, I think initially if I'd have told her two, three years before we set off like, or asked her, would you like to join me on a bike ride around the world? She'd have said no. But I think she saw me do it over four or five years on little tours, like no longer than two weeks. And she hadn't traveled as much as I had. And by the point where I was leaving the military, she she wanted to travel. And we had a, a conversation about traveling once I'd left the military. And 
the idea of cycling together came up and she was really up for it like super yeah excited about it so we just went about trying to make it I think as enjoyable for both of us and as exciting so that's why we pretty much started in, in Singapore we started in Southeast Asia which is a little bit unconventional it's not what most people do when they start a bike trip they normally start in their hometown but we was like let's go somewhere warm and let's make our way through uh, a lot of Southeast Asia which is a lot of uh, attractions for obvious reasons were you renting uh, like a flat at the time or did you own a home? No. So we, in the military, we, we lived in like an army house. So the, uh, the British army, you rent from them really, but it's really reduced. You're paying like, I don't know, in US dollars, maybe $200, so about £150 a month. So that was, we didn't have any property to sell. It was just once I left the army, we had to hand that over and we were effectively homeless. And it was just was, a matter yeah. of getting rid of your stuff. How, how, did, how did you find that process to um, declutter or whatever? It was wonderful. Yeah, genuinely wonderful. Like, uh, we'd been married, like I said, six years uh, by this point, And we lived in Cyprus. So getting rid of our stuff, we was having to move from Cyprus. If we were going to live a normal life anyway, we'd have gone back to the UK. So decluttering was a good thing to have done. And it helped fund this journey massively and getting rid of things that you don't realize you, you need. But I, as, I don't know, as 30-year-old people, we just accumulate a lot of rubbish in our lives. So getting rid of that clutter was, was really good. It was like a, a therapeutic experience almost. What was your initial budget? We tried to save as much as we could. We got to about £20,000 between the two of us. So £10,000 each was what we started with. Mm. Okay, not bad. Doable for what you had initially planned, Singapore to England? So that was, yeah, the big plan. We, t- we thought we'd take 18 months and 20, 20 grand is a very sizable amount and gives you a bit of an emergency fudge factor. And we didn't plan to spend all of it. We thought we'd have a bit left to kind of settle into what we thought would be normal life. But it, as with any adventure, that didn't turn out that way. So tell me about your bike. So I am riding a surly disc trucker, like many, many other cyclists before me and after me will. What adjustments have I done? I put a new handlebar on the front. So it's a surly, it's, a, it's like a flat bar, which I, I just wanted a bit more control and I can put a bit more stuff under there. But other than that, it's, and I've got a brook saddle. But other, yeah, other than those two kind of modifications, it's pretty much as you'd get out of the box. I was wondering how you find the the more flat handlebar because I think the or some people say the the one of the benefits of the drop bar is you get to change your hand positions as you ride to give yourself you know your hand some some uh, a break from being in the same position all the time. How do you find that? Yeah, so I've spent ten months pretty much with the drop bars, so that's a good amount of time to get to know them. And I maybe after six months, I was longing to get onto terrain that's just a little bit more challenging. And I think the handlebars is like a cheap way to do it rather than to get a whole new bike, especially for the, when I was in say like Cambodia with dirt roads, drop bars, are, it's, it's very, very doable, but you have less control. The hand position is, is a point. I would definitely agree with that. There's, I wouldn't say any one bar is better than the other. There's just pros and cons to both. And at the moment, I'm really happy with the change for me personally in the way that I'm riding in the terrain I like to go on. So yeah, I think it's just dependent on what you're after, really. And what's your tire width? Tire width. At the moment, I've got 26-inch tires with uh, 1.75 uh, width, but I have had a two 2.0s at one point, some big old Schwalbe Land Cruiser Pluses. Uh, they were quite good, but they, yeah, with, a, with anything, when you're traveling for quite a long time, it's sometimes just what's available. Yeah, in an ideal world, I would have a certain type of tire, but sometimes I need to change them, and I'm in a town which only has whatever's on the shelf and I have to just go with them. So yeah, it's okay at the moment. I'm in Canada right now whilst I'm recording this and mainly on con- on really well-paved roads. So having a really thick width at this moment isn't super important. I watched that video where you guys buy your bikes. I just wanted to comment. That was a very nice bike shop. Yeah, that's a, it's a shop called Cycle Heaven in York. We did a good bit of uh, research to find a good bike shop. And there's a really good bit of advice I'd always give somebody is people 
often like spend too much time thinking about what bike to buy but really it's the sizing that's super important if you get a bike that doesn't fit you're put, setting yourself up for future problems and injuries probably so yeah going to a bike shop and getting just fit for a good bike i'd always highly recommend that for anybody are you happy with the disc trucker so far yeah i'm happy there's been moments where i'd like oh, i wish i had a more a bike that could get me off road more but then equally it's i think the surly is a good balance between it can it's a bit of it can do everything not everything super well if i was going to take that bike on a really i don't know really tough mountain bike trail it'd be a bit of a struggle and especially with the weight but i could maybe get away with it just and people have taken surly disc truckers all over the world and the long haul trucker which is effectively the same the disc brakes really happy with them so i've got no complaints about having disc brakes over v brakes personally what kind of a luggage system do you have yeah, this is something that's adapted as well over time. So I did have the full standard four pannier setup with a front handlebar bag and a bag on top of that. So pretty heavily laden. And I've since, I've got rid of the front panniers. I did that in Alaska in the last couple of months, but instead put a couple of dry bags at the front. So a little bit bikepacking style, I'd say, but I wouldn't really consider it that. I've kept the rear panniers, put a rucksack on the back over the panniers and that's so i can go hiking that's the main motivation for that was i there's so much beautiful like hiking in canada alaska the united states that i'm just like and i I want the flexibility to be able to maybe put the bike away for a day and go climb a mountain and i have a half frame bag underneath in the frame which just allows me a little bit of space there and i put my sleeping systems or my sleeping bag and mat underneath my handlebars now which i wouldn't have been able to do with drop bars it's evolved i think uh, yeah anyone's bike setup usually does evolve over a long period of time if you're on the road for a long time how long have you been on the road so far i'm just under 400 days now i think like 390 including before i started in singapore i did a cycle through france into andorra and then cycled through Spain. I then flew to Singapore and started with Lucia there. What are some of the things that you ended up sending home because you packed them, you thought you would need them, but it turned out you don't need them at all? The first thing that comes to mind was my solar charger. I brought that and didn't use it for maybe, yeah, the whole time. Never got used. Some people swear by them, but for me, I've got a couple of power banks, which I rely on for, for charging anything. And two power banks will easily they last me 15 days. And I think within 15 days, I'll usually find somewhere to charge my stuff. So yeah, power, solar, it's just always undepend- not very dependable. So it's quite, quite good to get rid of that. So it's quite a big bulky thing. Do you have a favorite piece of kit? I say my sleeping mat, C to Summit. I think it's an Exped Plus one. It's really good. Like, I went through three sleeping mats before I had this one and yeah, the ones before, all inflatable sleeping mats. This Sea to Summit one, who I'm yeah, not sponsored by or anything, but they were, they were, it's, it's lasted now a good few months. And it's got this like double layer system. So you inflate one side, you inflate the second side. And if you got a puncture in the night, you wouldn't be sat on the ground, which is really cool. It's a little bit bulkier than a very lightweight one, but a good night's sleep is almost invaluable. So yeah, I think that's probably my favorite bit of kit. Well, let's talk about some of the places that you've been so far. Uh, Singapore didn't take very long to go through. Let's start in Malaysia. What what was your experience like in cycling through Malaysia? So in Malaysia, I started with Lucia. It was her first ever bike tour. So we decided to stay to the West Coast, which is a little bit more populated than the East Coast of Malaysia, but it's very flat. And that was really the, the aim, is to do something flat and easy, to just like slowly get ourselves into it. There's always food available. I don't think we got our stove out to cook once. Uh, We stayed in hotels nearly every single night, bar one, where we camped once on a beach. So it's like, for her, it was a really good introduction. And I'd have, yeah, for somebody that's maybe starting out, if you're an English speaker, Malaysia is pretty easy as well. Most people speak English in Malaysia. And the, even in Malay, the alphabet is like Roman script. So you can even read things, which is quite rare for, for Southeast Asia. 
so you can like yeah you can read items even if you don't know what it means you'll be able to say the words which which helps the food in malaysia i hear is quite good what was one of your dishes that you enjoyed roti chinai is by far one of the uh, my favorite foods uh roti is just like a pancake i think it's indian influenced and you'll often get it with some sort of curry sauce and chicken and sometimes you can even have it plain if you want but they'll cost maybe 10 cents a roti china and that's like us dollars you're paying nothing for this and as cycling food goes just getting these little pancakes by the side of a road is is amazing but there's also you get a lot of banana leafed packages with lots of rice in there the name of what that's called just escapes me but yeah it's effectively a banana skin wrapped in a, with lots of rice and sometimes anchovies bits of fish so yeah really hearty good cycling food the taste of, of really influenced by the chinese culture the indian culture and malay culture as well so you're getting loads of different fusions of taste which is amazing how's the traffic there do you find it pretty um is it aggressive yeah i didn't find it too bad i they have fairly good shoulders and i think maybe coming from the uk and then landing in the Singapore, then straight into Malaysia, UK is pretty bad. So when you get into Malaysia, you're like, oh, this is great compared to uh, the where we've just come from. And it's warm and it's great. But the, uh, the traffic was okay. There's some of the cities, we didn't go into Kuala Lumpur, which I think would be more of a challenge. I think there is a cycle route you could follow into there. But we pretty much stuck to the coast. And I would always look on my map and try and find the most minor road that followed the coast and that would often be a dirt road and that's where you see all the wildlife that's where they hang out all the the monkeys and the monitor lizards and you just see things that um, genuinely blew my mind having didn't even know monitor lizards were a thing these are like ginormous nearly the length of my body lizards walking around and they just scurry away into the bushes and seeing them daily is uh yeah when you've just just like i said just flown from europe you're like well this is another planet this is amazing after malaysia you crossed the border into thailand what was your planned route through thailand plan route was to pretty much hook, hook the coast again and head on first on the the west hand side and then we crossed over some mountains in the south of thailand and then hooked the east coast pretty much like up to Bangkok. There's a it's really thin part of Thailand there because of the Myanmar border and then Thailand. So that you're pretty restricted to where you can go for that bit towards Bangkok. And then from there, as you get towards Bangkok, we decided not to go to Bangkok and avoided the big city. We went to a place called Kampang Pet, and then we uh, then headed west to uh, the Myanmar border at May Sot, and we just followed the Myanmar border, right up to the top northwest of Thailand, some of the genuinely some of the most steep mountains and hills I've ever come across. And that took us into Pai and Chiang Mai, and then we entered Laos near Chiang Rai. Well, let's back up a bit. First of all, tell me about some of the food experiences in Thailand. Yeah, the food changes vastly, as because it's a long country. I think we cycle nearly 3,000 kilometers through Thailand. Uh, which is quite a way. And in the South, there's still a lot of spices. It's almost influenced by that Malaysia taste. And the further North you get, you start hugging the coast. There's loads of seafood influenced dishes, still with lots of rice and noodles. And as you get further uh, to the Northwest of Thailand, the food again changes and the fruits change seasonally. You're getting more like Myanmar and Burmese influenced food. Then you get to say Chiang Mai there's foods like khao soy, which is like a curried noodle. I think that's probably my favorite meal in the whole of Thailand. It's just amazing. And yeah, so it's really it's really interesting to watch the food change. The, the, the constant is pretty much noodle soup, which is called goi tiao. And knowing how to say goi tiao in Thailand was like one of the most important phrases because it means you're just going to get a good meal wherever you are and it's going to be hearty and it's going to be cheap. How long were you in Thailand? Two and a half months total. Wow, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, it was really good. Do you have an opportunity to use warm showers or couch surfing, or are you just staying in uh, inexpensive hotels? I would say Thailand particularly, I'd say is about 80% inexpensive hotels, maybe 10% hosted by people. 
and yeah a bit of camping more camping as we got to the north into the mountains uh, there's quite a lot of camping there actually but for the majority of the country it, it was um yeah either cheap hotels or camping in police stations that's quite a common thing for thailand which a lot of people won't realize that police in thailand with tourists are super friendly and if you pretty much turn up to a police station and ask is there somewhere i can sleep they'll just point over to a, a flat area of grass they might ask to see your passport first but they'll send you to the flat area they'll let you use their showers sometimes there's been one occasion where i even like hooked up to the wi-fi within the police station so yeah there is so many different and temples again temples is another really good place to sleep in thailand which uh, yeah a lot of people use that as well is the chance to be randomly hosted high in southeast asia or does the hosting tend to be more planned yeah my experience randomly hosted would be more temples and police stations i would don't know if you'd really count a police station but a temple i'd kind of count because you're like hosted by the the monks that live there Um, but by random people on the street probably less so hosted through warm showers i think i did it maybe it's five or six times. One one occasion was wonderful up in the north of Thailand, stayed at a coffee farm and ended up going and seeing how all the coffee was was made. And yeah, that's that was a, that was with a local Thai guy. So there is definitely opportunity to use warm showers. And there's some absolute gems in that country of people that just love meeting travelers. You did a, a loop. I'm going to probably say it wrong, like the Mae Hong Song loop. And that's perfect. That's okay. exactly. Yeah. All right. I got it. And, uh, Nailed it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is where you. I, I'm curious. I want to want you to tell me a little bit about this this route, and also um, this is where you started. I think to run into a lot of other cycle tourists, or at least other like maybe daytime cycle cyclists. Yeah, it's really famous amongst mount, uh, motorbikers, particularly, and as a result of that, it's then passed down to us crazy cyclists that decide to go on these roads. We only saw cyclists going in the opposite direction to us which is the common way to do it. So we were going the less traveled clockwise way. Most people start in Chiang Mai because it's a big central hub, and then they head anti-clockwise, effectively uh, hugging the Myanmar border, going up to the highest point in Thailand. I think it's called Don Ethanon. That's the highest mountain. Uh, So we didn't do that part of it because it just didn't work out for our route. But yeah, we saw maybe 10 to 12 other cyclists on that route. And some Thai people that were just, uh, yeah, cycling for maybe a week, just on their bikes. There was a good, I met um, a Swiss guy on that route who was like from the Alps. And he was saying that this steepness of them hills are like so much more crazy than any hills in the Alps. And that was like, oh, okay, that's good to know. <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty, pretty steep at some depth, particularly up near Pai, which is, a really it's a bit of a touristy town up in the mountains which yeah the hills there are, are ruthless tell me a little bit about the that town or the little city of pai yeah pai back in the day was like this sleepy farming rice paddy village it sits in a valley and i think a lot of hippies in the 80s i think got got a hold of this gem and started putting businesses there like you're uh, mostly westerners a lot of australians and americans and brits and I, I say that but even now when you go there it does have this authentic charm about it which not many of the northern thailand touristy or well, thailand touristy places have often the tourism can override it but pies kept this charm i would say and the night market is possibly one of the best night markets i've ever seen it's just covers like maybe a mile long down the whole town every bit of thai food you could ever imagine so yeah that and it's not crazy busy because it's a bit out of the way so not many people make it all the way up into the mountains to get there which which is always nice then you make your way down in chiang mai how, how long did you stay in chiang mai i stayed in chiang mai for two weeks i was, we, I was applying for a chinese visa that's where i got that and doing a little bit of bike repairs so it was a good little time to to rest up before hitting china was the plan what is Chiang Mai like? What what was your experience like there? I think it's probably up there with one of my top two favorite cities, maybe even the world. I really like Chiang Mai. It's it's got an old uh, like walled city. It's got a moat in the middle, which gives it this compact feel of the city center, which is loads of temples. It, I think it helped that I was there 
during uh, the the Lantern Festival, which the name escapes me off the top of my head. But it happens in November. Lots of people setting off their lanterns. You're talking probably thousands of lanterns in the sky. They have to turn, close all the airports down. So that was really nice. And I got to meet lots of other cyclists and other cycle tourists in Chiang Mai. So that was quite a good break, having spent quite a lot of time without seeing other other people that you could speak English to. I think maybe spent almost a month not speaking English to people in Thailand, which you wouldn't really consider because it's quite a touristy place. So Ch- Chiang Mai is brilliant. Yeah, it's a place I want to get to. Yeah, you would, I genuinely wouldn't regret it. The food there, I would say, is some of the best food in Southeast Asia. You could spend a year there just eating all the different local foods, and you still have more to do. After Thailand, you're into Laos. And how long were you in Laos? So on this first run into Laos was only five days. We went from Thailand to the Chinese border, which wasn't the plan. Like We kind of changed our plans fairly frequently. And it's kind of a running theme of the this journey is to change your plans. But yeah, five days in Laos, which is definitely not enough. But I did return to Laos later. Okay, so then you head into China. How long were you in China for? We spent two months in China. And we was yeah entered in Yunnan province in the south of China. Yeah, going through the, the border there from mountainous Laos into China, it's like entering a different world. You go from very undeveloped, jungly Laos into very developed jungle china into i think it's called zingshan bana nature reserve they have wild elephants in the south of uh, china here and uh, lots of hilly mountainous cycling but then the hilly mountains in the south of china turn into tea plantations as you get further north towards kunming but that was where in china the south of china lucia she fell off her bike had a bit of an accident she hurt her leg so we it was only two or three weeks out she had out there it wasn't too serious but we went to the hospital in kunming and yeah she was okay and we rested up in kunming or she rested up in kunming and spent christmas and new year there so i think we spent nearly three weeks in kunming which is a lot of our chinese visa time eaten away there so we had to come up with a new plan rather than continuing on through china possibly having to get trains or we could we, we decided to change our route completely and what was your, the new route there's a lot of southeast asia we felt we did both of us felt we didn't do so we both decided let's head south let's go into vietnam a country we didn't go to let's go back into laos a country we spent five days in and go to cambodia so there was a lot of things still left to see I and mean, it kind of dawned on us both that the journey wasn't about making it from a to b it can be about wiggling a lot more than the planned route and being able to make a decision based on how you feel that day rather than sticking with a plan became more important the way that we wanted to have this journey. So yeah, we, we made a new route. Let's loop around through these, this mountainous South of China. And then we cross back into Vietnam on the most Eastern crossing point near the coast in Vietnam. Let's talk about Vietnam. What was, um, so you come through the North, you're in Hanoi. What's Hanoi like? Hanoi, I think that's the second favorite city <laughs> in Southeast Asia. Uh, we spent a week in Hanoi. Um, Hanoi, lots of tourists for sure, but also lots of locals. It, the locals are definitely, it's a big thriving city. This is the old former northern communist area of Vietnam. So I didn't go to the south of Vietnam, but apparently a different feel to the south. But the food is another level. Vietnamese food, for anyone that's tried it, it's balanced almost perfectly. They just know how to work flavors. So eating bun cha, which is like this noodle soup with bits of uh, like grilled pork, was just, yeah, that was amazing. And the fruits, the fruits are just every dragon fruit and mangoes. It's like, again, I could spend a lifetime just eating food. There's a common theme of my journey here is just eating food in, in all these cities. But Southeast Asia is famous for it, so you've got to make the most of it whilst you're there. You know, I've seen, I've never been there, but I've seen some videos of Hanoi. Based on what I see, the word I would use to describe it is bohemian. Am I totally off there with that description or? There's a lot of old French architecture from when the French colonized Vietnam. So there's like the old, I think it's the old opera house is very um, French. So it does have this Paris feel about it. But imagine like throwing 
bits of Paris architecture into the craziness of Southeast Asia. They've adopted some of the French foods, like the best of the French foods, and then thrown it with their own twist and their own Vietnamese way. And the people there are really forward thinking. I spent uh, an afternoon with uh, and an evening with one of the, a young Vietnamese lad who he uh, was a student, I think about 18, 19, and he uh, got in touch with me through Instagram and was like, can I take you out, out and show you the place? And I was like, that's amazing. So um, yeah, he took us about and he had very yeah forward thinking thoughts and he wanted Vietnam, the best for Vietnam. And it was really good to get that local thought on it because often if you're cycling with another person you don't spend a lot of time with the locals and and that's what makes a journey like this it's always that local time you can spend and hearing their thoughts on the world and their politics and without imparting your own just just observing i know that the the traffic can be kind of crazy in vietnam a lot of motor scooters how did you find cycling in vietnam the whole of Southeast Asia was the most difficult for for traffic, for sure. The, the bus drivers are horrendous. There's no driving standards at all, and it's whoever's the biggest owns the road. It's the only place I saw an accident with a woman hit on a scooter on the side of the road in a bad place. So Vietnam's the only place I've been really worried. Um, there's very little shoulder in Vietnam. Initially, I planned to stay on the coast and go towards like Ha Long Bay, which is a really popular tourist resort. But very quickly, was like, no, let's get off this busy road. And then I cut inland to really quiet roads and then eventually went onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is a little bit, it's, it actually is a lot quieter than the coast, particularly in the north. So yeah, I was really glad to have made that decision based on the traffic as opposed to what did I want to see. Okay, so after Vietnam, I think you this is where you cross into Cambodia? As Brits, we get 15 days visa-free, as in we didn't have to pay for a visa in Vietnam. So we only had 15 days to spend in the, in the north. Then we crossed back into Laos and then cycled for a month through Laos. And we actually uh, we cycled with two of your previous guests, uh, Linda and Tim, for maybe about two weeks, two and a half weeks, which was really good. And then we entered Cambodia. What's that do for for you guys is you're, when you're cycling as a couple that all of a sudden you have a, another couple to cycle with? How does that change the dynamic? Dynamics are super important when you're cycling with anybody. And I think when you're with one other person, you get into your swing and you know how to do it. Whereas Tim and Linda cycled quicker than we did. They'd cycled from Europe to this point with lighter bikes. And I think what really helped with us four is we all had to kind of compromise to a middle point because we liked each other. We didn't have to do that. We just really enjoyed our company. And that became the motivating factor for us to spend time together. So they saw how like me and Lucia, we just, which is my uh, like former partner, we decided we would change our minds fairly frequently. Whereas Tim and Linda had a plan and very rarely changed their minds. And then as a result of meeting us, they initially planned to go back into the south of Vietnam and then they didn't because they wanted to spend more time in Cambodia. So we influenced each other in many ways. I changed my bike setup a little bit because they were lighter and seeing somebody lighter and how much easier it is to pack in the morning and you're like, oh, that looks good. So yeah, the dynamics was good and leaving them was genuinely a really hard moment because we we formed this little team and we yeah could easily have spent more time together but even today like we still keep in touch we send each other messages fairly frequently and it's really good to to have done that to have built this unique connection with somebody which only us have that in the world at what point do you make your way into cambodia followed the mekong pretty much all the way south so we enter cambodia this would be march uh yeah march 2019 and uh, how long were you there? Uh, I spent about a month in Cambodia, just short, I think just over three weeks. Uh, yeah, I cycled from the Laos border down to Phnom Penh. And then I stayed in Phnom Penh with a friend, another cycle tourist who I met in Chiang Mai. And he lived in Phnom Penh now as a teacher. So, And then we went on a bike tour together. And by this point, me and Lucia, we decided to effectively go our separate ways. So she'd flown home to the UK and I continued cycling by myself. I cycled to the south of Cambodia and then hugged the southern coast of Cambodia and re-entered Thailand. How would you compare Laos to Cambodia? 
yeah, something we all do when we cross these borders. All we do, we we compare. I do it. Everyone does it. It's like what's different, and it's, it feels a little bit more raw. I've spent a good amount of time in like in places like Kenya and Ethiopia in a previous life, and it felt more like Kenya. It felt like more like Africa than Laos did. Laos is still a bit more like Thailand. Uh, but you see these ginormous cows, which like sounds quite boring seeing a cow. But these cows are like bigger than humans. I've never seen these big white cows that are giant. They're only found in Cambodia. And seeing them being like herded down the street. And I think the effects of the, the genocide is a really, it's obviously got a long lasting effect. And there's a real hope in the country. But there's still that underlying darkness and sadness, which you know is present. And whenever I see an older person, I'm all, I was always like in awe of these people to have survived it and knowing what they've gone through in a very fairly recent history, which again, Vietnam has similar, not quite the same as Cambodia, but it's got its own history with the Vietnam war, but they seem to have recovered more so because it was further away in time. I think. Did you find the internet to be good everywhere through Southeast Asia? Yeah, that was a big surprise. One of the good things is if you want a phone card uh, to have mobile phone internet on the go, It'll cost you maybe 5 to $10 for a full month, pretty much unlimited internet. And I would say that is more or less every Southeast Asian country. China's a little bit more expensive, but still not crazy. China, it can be harder to get SIM cards. You need to be in a big city and you have to know exactly where to go. But there wasn't much, many times where I didn't have internet. The Wi-Fi is usually pretty good and I could rely on that. I'd almost say the internet was better in Southeast Asia than it definitely has been for me through this part now where I am in Alaska and Canada, uh, which is, yeah, it's very connected because there's a lot of people everywhere. And yeah, the internet's thriving on mobile phones in these countries. Is it in Phnom Penh where you, do you catch uh, an airplane to go to Korea? So I continued south through across the coast. I left Phnom Penh. I didn't fly from there. I headed back into Thailand I went to an island in Thailand, had like a little break, last bit of sun before heading to South Korea from Bangkok. So that was my plan. When you got to South Korea, was your plan to cycle one of the their famous cycle paths? There's the, the Four Rivers Trail, the Four Rivers Path, which heads through the center of Korea. And that's the one I decided to go on. I, I went too shy. I always like really don't plan until the last moment. But I, I decided to go on it because there's a lot of people I've heard talk really good, positive things about this. So I decided to give it a go. And yeah, that Four Rivers Trail was really good to a point. I think for me personally, it was maybe a little bit too tame. I don't know if, yeah, that's probably the best way to describe it. It's beautiful. It's uh, really tra- it's traffic free. But that also means I didn't get the same human encounters, which I've I had every single day in Southeast Asia. You'd often get other cyclists and be able to talk to them, but it's not quite the same as just randomly stumbling into a fishing village and somebody being like, oh, why are you here? So I decided about halfway down through Korea to leave that Four Rivers Trail and head towards the East Coast. I followed the East Coast down to the bottom of Korea to a city called Busan. When you get to Seoul, you got to put your bike back together. And then how yeah. difficult is it to find the trail uh, cycling out of the airport? Well, when you're in Seoul, Seoul's a little bit away from the airport. The airport sits on an island just on the uh, the west side of, of Korea. So I, I spend like three or four days with a warm showers host with another woman who's also cycled around the world. That was really cool. Um, her name's Ju Hee. So I spent three, four days with her and her family. Putting the bike together and getting to the start, uh, as soon as you get to Seoul, Seoul's not as crazy as big a city as I imagined. Maybe it was the effect of leaving Bangkok and entering Seoul. It's a lot more calmer and reserved in the very Korean way compared to the craziness of Bangkok. So arriving there, there's a big river that follow, that goes to the south of Seoul. If you get on that river, that, there's a cycle path there, and that's the start of it. You just hug that river. Uh, so it's really easy to stay on there and then pick up the signs. So about halfway down, you got off the trail and headed to Busan. So what were you seeing when you were off of the trail? As soon as I left it, it suddenly became 
what I, I was looking for, like mountains, a lot of local life was happening as opposed to this was an old, I think the rivers, the cycle route, the four rivers route is an old railway line. So I'm now going through towns and villages. You're seeing when you get to the coast, like I said earlier, fishing villages. And uh, I also met a Frenchman and cycled with him. His name's Arthur. And he'd cycled from France to Southeast Asia. He'd got a flight to Korea. So we spent a bit of time cycling together. And we would get offered food randomly by Koreans that would see us camping uh, just by the side. And we'd see a lot of these um, hot baths. This is a real like hidden gem, which if you ever go to Korea, they're called Jim Jil Bangs. And these hot baths can be sometimes really small buildings, sometimes huge buildings buildings with three stories and they'll have restaurants in there they'll have the hot baths where you can get a get clean and then they have a rest area where a lot of businessmen in korea do this and rather than getting a hotel they pay five dollars us dollars equivalent and they will they'll sleep the night you'll pay for 24 hours access and you'll sleep just on the floor with electricity and Wi-Fi. So we used that a good few times just to rest up, to get clean. It was very civilized. We were like the most cleanest cycle tourists that have ever cycled, cycled through Korea. What was your favorite food in Korea? Kimchi, very high on the list. I'd never had Korean food until I entered Korea, so I didn't have a clue. Um, the Korean barbecue I once tried was another level. Or you can eat meat, which was super kindly offered to me from one of the hosts I stayed with. Um, I wouldn't, my budget wouldn't have stretched to all you can eat meat any other time. But uh, yeah, even the basic noodles, if you just get a basic noodle soup, it'll always be different and you'll always be getting something unique and local. But yeah, kimchi is a staple. It's uh, And kimbap as well. That's uh, like Korean kind of like sushi. It's like rolled seaweed and rice. But that's a, another fantastic cycling food. Are you able to take ferries to Japan or is it too far? Yeah, yeah. You get an overnight ferry which was super cheap. I intentionally just looked at the cheapest ticket, paid maybe 20 US dollars with the bike. You don't get a room. You get a like shared room with six people. You get a little space on the floor. So I had six very drunk Japanese men sharing a room with me. Um, yeah, that was a... So a lot of these people are just uh, a lot of, I don't know, workmen and sailors. So it's a very... And there was also a artist on the, on, the, on the ferry across this. First time I've ever seen an artist perform to music. She was like smearing paint all over her face and to like techno music. It was like, welcome to Japan. This is crazy. Now, I think you're still putting together some of your Japan videos and still putting them out. I don't think I've seen all of them yet. But what yeah. what was your planned route through Japan? I changed a few times. So the initial plan was to cycle a few of the southern areas of Japan um, and get about to Kyoto, which is kind of like in the middle of the south of Japan, and take a 24-hour ferry to the most northern island, which is called Hokkaido. Now, I changed my plan. I didn't end up doing that, but I did cycle effectively from a place called Fukuoka, which is the ferry port town you get the boat from Korea to, and I cycled to Tokyo by hopping to a few islands along the way, but pretty much a straight line. Um, it's the most unwiggliest route I think I've, I've done in a country. Well, what is it like cycling through Japan? Um, the infrastructure should be good. What was your experience like? Yeah, Japan is... A very strange place. It's been, it's an island. And as a Brit, I'm very used to us being different to everybody else. But Japan has been sat as an island for a long time. So their culture is unlike anywhere I've ever been. It's so polite, almost like, yeah, everybody's taking their shoes off. Uh, Every, if you're going into a, a restaurant, you'll be taking your shoes off to go in. There's a very respectful nature. There's lots of old people. I think it's the oldest population in the world. So there's a lot of respect for your elders. And I, as a cyclist, spend so much time in these rural areas, which are almost like empty. All the young people have all moved to the cities. There's a real problem in Japan with these small villages and mountains just like emptying and just having old people there and it'll eventually have no population so that was quite interesting to see it firsthand to to get into all these mountains but the infrastructure it's not made for cycling i'd say that particularly yeah they're not used to people cycling on the roads all the japanese people cycle on the pay on the sidewalk on like the pavement 
so when I'm on the road, the drivers aren't too used to it, but it's, it feels it does still feel safe. People are very respectful. I didn't at any point feel in any danger. But if you're used to shoulders or if you're used to having a dedicated cycle route, Japan doesn't often have that. How did you find the cost of things there? It's meant to be traditionally on par with the UK as expensive, but Japan is super easy to camp for free. There's even a Facebook group where you can put free camping and hot springs, and there's a map where loads of people have open source put in places where you can camp for free. And a lot of these will be hot spring areas, there'll be service stations, they're called Michi no Ekis. And these service stops have Wi Fi and running water and, and toilets and they they close at 6 p.m so from 6 p.m till usually 9 a.m there's nobody there and a lot of japanese people will camp in their cars outside of these michi no ekis so i would pitch a tent and sometimes it'd be me and maybe a couple of other people pitching tents outside there and as long as you're up and you're gone before business starts it's pretty cheap and it's pretty you're free to do that see me i think technically it's not allowed but again as long as you're respectful and you're not leaving any trace it's kind of accepted so yeah and the food I probably didn't eat too many meals in Japan, which is a, another thing I, I'd love to have done. I was cooking a lot because it is quite expensive. One meal would be my whole day's budget. Uh, so, so I did do it a couple of times. I definitely had a couple of sushi days, but it wasn't an awful lot of eating Japanese food, unfortunately. How's the terrain there? It's mountainous. It's a big old mountainous island. As soon as you get away from the coast, it's no longer flat and it can make it pretty steep, hard climbs. It's up there with some of the hardest climbs I've done, I think, on this journey. But there's a lot of rewards in getting up to these mountains. You're away from the traffic more. Uh, if you're near the coast, you're generally going to be with urban sprawl, which is good in a way because it's flat. That's probably the only positive, and there's lots of amenities. But getting up to the mountains is is pretty much. I always find when I get up there, I'm super happy. So it depends on what you want, really. Did you ever consider doing any cycling in Taiwan when you were over there? Oh, I've been asked this so many times. I've met so many Taiwanese people that have said, "Well, oh, why didn't you come to Taiwan?" It's on the list of places I definitely want to go to. And yeah, at some point, this, this list is never ending. <laughs> Taiwan is definitely on there. But yeah, I've heard very good things about Taiwan. I've heard it's uh, yeah super good for cycling, good coastal routes, really hard mountainous routes if you go into the middle. But yeah, one day. I did meet a lot of Taiwanese cyclists in Japan, which was very cool, and spent a good bit of time with them. But one day in the future. What in your mind is the most challenging part of cycle touring? The first thing that comes to mind is saying goodbye all the time to people. And I kind of touched on it when I talked about cycling with the other couple, with Tim and Linda. Is um, Because I'm transient, I'll build sometimes the strongest connections with people. Stronger than some like of my oldest friends that I've maybe been friends with for five, ten years or whatever. And I could spend two weeks in somebody's home and then I've got to say goodbye and yeah it can be it's, it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster sometimes when you somebody accepts you into their life in a snapshot and they really open their hearts and I think one of the benefits of it being 2019 and for me particularly having YouTube videos and so an active social media presence it does mean I can exist still in their lives and we may reconnect in the future but yeah that's the hardest for me what's your favorite part of cycle touring it's them crazy things that you just cannot predict to happen you could one minute be washing in a waterfall and before you know it somebody's pulled you into their home they've taken you up to the top of a mountain they've brought you into their parents house to have dinner which might be a plate of insects and stewed fish curry and pig's hearts and then you'll yeah it's these unexpected things like a day can change in 30 minutes 10 minutes it's just you never know what's going to happen the next day and it's sometimes nothing happens and then something crazy can happen and it's them random acts of kindness which yeah that's my favorite part you're putting yourself quite vulnerably into the world with the elements and the weather and the terrain 
And in my experience, like 99.9% of the world just are super kind. And yeah, experiencing that rather than living by the world is scary and bad narrative, which we often hear. I just don't believe it's true in my experience. Do you have any regrets so far? Not really. No, not, not big regrets. There's, there's been little, little minor lessons I've learned, which I think one of the, my first warm showers host that I ever stayed with, I stayed for one night. It was in Malaysia and uh, their names are Farnan and Ash and they're from Malaysia and they, they've cycled toured through New Zealand recently, which was after I met them, but they wanted us to stay with them for more than one night. They're like, stay another day. And I was like, no, we've got to keep going. And I, yeah, that day it stuck with me for a good month or so about how much they wanted us to stay and how I was so impatient to go and keep moving because it was only maybe a month into my journey. So now I am much more willing to change my plan and spend time with people because that's the reason I'm doing it. So I'm not in a hurry. And I think that's what I have regretted previously is just not yeah, taking more time with some people. Speaking of, of people, maybe you can tell me about some of the people that you've met so far that have inspired you. It's so difficult because there's so many. But the biggest standout person for me is a guy called Scott Sharrick. And I imagine Scott will listen to this podcast, so he'll probably love the fact that I've mentioned his name. But Scott's a cycle tourist. He's in his late 50s, and he's from America. He's from uh, Rochester, New York. I met him in Chiang Mai. And he got in touch with us uh, through the website and he'd watched the videos. And as a solo, older cycle tourist by himself, he's cycling around the world as well. And he wanted to just connect with some like-minded people. Well, his story was that he had a stroke at the age of 55. And as a result of having this stroke, he recovered and he'd worked in healthcare his whole life and thought he was quite fit. And he's like decided, no, I want to live my dream. And he decided to cycle around the world at like 57 years old. And he started in Cambodia and he cycled for maybe, I think it was well over 10, 12,000 kilometers in Southeast Asia. And at one point he was in Chiang Mai, only like a thousand or so kilometers from where he started, but he'd done like 12,000 kilometers. And seeing him do his wiggly roots and he's since made his way into India, Nepal. He's now making his way again down through the south of Thailand as we speak. And he's just so inspiring. He takes some amazing photographs. So it's realizing you're never too old and you, you can have bad things happen to you, but if you really want to do it, you can do it. So yeah, he was the most inspiring dude I've met so far. Do you happen to remember his website? Uh, scottsharrickphotography.com is one of his web that's his photography website and then his second one is adventures of a regular guy that's where he writes about his journey but yeah really good photography to the point where he's, he's uh yeah i'm quite envious of some of the photos he takes so you've met a lot of these travelers you've been inspired by many of them what's the best piece of advice that any of them have given to you some advice scott gave me so who I've just talked about just then, maybe I would also actually say stupidly, and this is a very debatable, um, heated topic, is I didn't wear a helmet for the first maybe four months of my cycle journey through Malaysia and Thailand, lots of hard shoulders, lots of space, felt quite safe. And it was very hot, so I wore a baseball cap. And I met Scott in Chiang Mai and mentioned I didn't wear a helmet and he was a respiratory therapist, his career, working in hospitals. And that includes, for his job, turning people's life support systems off that if they are in critical care and aren't going to survive. He told me about the amount of people he's encountered that were in either vegetative states or really, really ill, effectively, really badly injured. And he's like, most of the people there didn't expect to be there. It's rarely their fault. It can be anyone, anything can happen. Somebody could be texting and not see you. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you to wear a helmet because if I tell you to, you won't do it because you're too stubborn, <laughs> which is very true. If it had said you need to get a helmet out of them, I probably wouldn't have listened. But him just telling his story about that really made me think. And the next day I went and bought a helmet and I've not needed it, but you never hopefully do need it. So yeah, that's my best bit of practical hopefully save my life one day advice what advice would you give to somebody if they were just starting out their cycle tour 
based on me being quite serious there about the injury aspect, which could always happen, I would say don't take it all too seriously. The internet's full of people with lots of opinions and gear heads and people that love to give part their advice and there's me now giving advice but i would always just say do what makes you happy and work out your own thing and don't worry about what other people are really doing these journeys are about enjoying life and if you set these strict restrictions on yourself for some people that's great and there's nothing wrong with that and equally if you don't that's also great there's no right or wrong way we're just doing our our thing in life so yeah don't take it too seriously is my my bit of advice do you have any recommendations uh websites apps that you found useful and that you can recommend to people about traveling through asia or just traveling by bike in general there's one really good one, which I, for Asia particularly, Southeast Asia, which was, I don't know how I found it, but the website is called mrpumpy.net. And it's some, it's quite old now, but it's about a cyclist who wrote quite detailed diaries about his cycle tours through Thailand and Vietnam and Laos. But he writes it from this fictional character's perspective, I think because he didn't want to reveal his own identity. It's super useful. It gave me a little bit of a guideline of what to expect. And that was maybe seven, eight years ago. But now you can see how things have changed even from his blog. There's also Crazy Guy on a Bike, which is very well known in the cycle touring community. It's like a resource of a lot of tour journals and you can search by country. And my former partner, she wrote a very detailed account of our journey. So that exists on there. And it's also really good. If you search China, you're going to find 200 journals of people that have gone to places. And you might find an area that sparks some imagination. So, yeah, Crazy Guy on a Bike is really good. MrPompey.com? Dot net. Yeah. Dot net. So how do you, yeah. how, how do you spell Pompey? P U M p y is how you spell pumpy yeah it's quite funny but it's not too serious i think that's with in line with my don't take it all too seriously a lot of people take this cycle touring world very seriously and they i don't know they almost make it not fun this is all about having fun that's the kind of my ethos of traveling by bike is is enjoying it and telling the stories of the people you meet and and just putting some positivity in there. So that Mr. Pumpy definitely does that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's transition the conversation into making videos because I know that you refer to yourself, not really as a cyclist, but as a filmmaker. Yeah. That's been a, a new, it's almost like a realization that if I say it enough times, it might become true. <laughs> but yeah, I make, I've been making videos and of my journey since I started. So it was a very intentional, I'm going to film this journey and to, for, for multiple purposes to ever, to kind of entertain people, to inform a bit of educate, but it's, yeah, it's also for me, it's an apprenticeship is I'm learning in public is how I'm seeing it through the means of YouTube. And yeah, it's very much learning from a zero level and hopefully getting better with every month that passes by. What is your current filmmaking kit? A camera. I use a, a mirrorless Micro Four Thirds Panasonic Lumix G7, which films in 4K. It's yeah fairly affordable as far as them level of cameras go, and it's fairly small. It fits in my handlebar bag really well. I've got a couple of lenses that go with it, uh, like a zoom lens and a normal kit lens. A tripod, super important. It's just a cheapest tripod i could buy in japan i lost a tripod and yeah 20 25 dollar tripod that's super important probably the most important piece of kit i have other than the actual camera is the tripod i, I have a gopro uh, hero 7 black which uh yeah i use that for cycling when i'm on the bike to talk to the camera occasionally and i have a drone uh, a mavic 2 pro which isn't essential it's probably my biggest camera gear luxury if i could cut anything that'd be the first thing i would get rid of but uh it does add definitely another layer of seemingly beautiful 
uh, shots. But if you use too much drone footage, it gets a bit boring, I think. So, yeah, I've got to use it spare, not use it sparingly, but edit, put the footage in sparingly and use it for a purpose. What about audio? Audio, yeah, I use a little shotgun mic on the top of my camera. It's a, I can't remember the name of the brand now. I went through a few Rode ones and they've all broken. I'm sure they are good, but I'm abusing this camera kit. But I've got a, a Boya mic, B-O-Y-A. It's cheaper than a Rode mic and it works just as well as far as I'm concerned for the audio level I need. Uh, it's a shotgun mic that goes on top of the camera and the thing that breaks the most are the audio connectors, the auxiliary cables. So having a couple of them spare is always useful. So your GoPro, you know, do you use that when you ride? Do you have a, a certain spot where you mount it to? Yeah, my go-to probably 90% of the time uh, place is to have it on a fairly long extendable, kind of like a selfie stick. I've got that attached to my handlebars and to my like, front stem, to my stem uh, with a couple of Velcro straps really tight so it cannot move. But then occasionally I'll move that camera around. And I think that that's a good thing to do to get different perspectives. That's the benefit of a GoPro is it can go loads of places and if you just have it in one place with that big wide angle shot it's got it gets a bit boring again so it's just mixing it up as much as i can so i'm kind of curious about how you're learning if you're just kind of trying to do all this on your own or if there or if you have some youtubers that are you're inspired by definitely inspired by a lot of people and i think that's one of the best ways to be to learn is watching other people's videos which it can be quite hard to do when you're on a bike yeah other youtubers particularly there's a guy called ryan van Duza, american guy who makes bike touring and adventure videos uh johan uh, i think you don't know how to pronounce his last name gugarev maybe he's a really good cycle touring bike packing he cycles loads of crazy routes um there's a guy called ed pratt who unicycled around the world young lads and he's just recently finished that um, so they're like kind of the main four people that I definitely look up to and see their level of YouTube editing and learn bits from them. Um, there's another guy called uh, Matt Galat who makes pretty daily vlogs as he's going. He's uh, riding a recumbent tricycle, very different to my bicycle, but he's really immersed himself into YouTube and we've become friends over the last few months. We've never met in person, but that's one of the things that's really good about YouTube is you can connect with the p people with a similar mentality to you. So they're my main YouTube, like almost friends and some of them are friends and some of them are just inspirations for me. Yeah. I'm familiar with all of those guys, except for Matt. His channel is called Jayo Nation. Oh yeah. I have seen, I have, I am familiar with now that you've said that. Yeah. I've seen a video or two. I think he speaks almost fluent Chinese. He spent a lot of time cycling in China, and we just missed paths in China. And then he stayed with the same guy I stayed with in Phnom Penh. I lost a drone in Phnom, in Cambodia, and he made a video where he tried to find my drone. So there's a good bit of like connection we've had from, a, from afar. It's good to have the support of this network of like-minded world traveling filmmakers almost which yeah i never thought about that when I, before i set off i didn't think that would happen but it has which is really good yeah ed's channel i've seen some of those videos that is one heck of a unicycle <laughs> <laughs> like his videos alone are amazing but the fact he's on a unicycle like you almost forget that that that's hard in itself and he's making these really high-end stories and that's he's still editing right now i think his usa series he does it in a different way to all we all do it in different ways he does it where he films a lot takes time edits whereas i'm f editing and filming on the go and whereas matt with jayo he's editing and filming daily like another level i've spoken to him and said how do you do it and he's like it's just work buddy that's it just work hard but yeah it's different needs and different wants for different people when i saw ed's channel for the first time that just blew my mind was just the the unicycle itself because it's not like the typical unicycle you might have seen before with a little tire that may be 18 inches in diameter this tire is like four like four four and a half feet in diameter it seems like he's it's, it's it only puts it into perspective whenever you see him cycle with another cyclist and how high he is 
And I think a lot of that is due to, I'm guessing, I think it's down to it's a fixed gear. He has to pedal all the time. So having a bigger wheel, I imagine, makes that easier than, especially with the hills he's climbing and he's often pushing it up these hills. But yeah, he did it. He cycled around the world and yeah, the videos are his lasting legacy almost of that, which it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. How's your channel evolved since you started? Yeah, it started very much as just I wanted to just share my journey. And so there was no like aim of making any money. And it was very much I, I still would be very much doing this if I made no money at all. And I think the way it's evolved is I've realized <laughs> I've kind of created what I hate to say it, but it's almost like a business. It's a brand and money is coming in and that mindset of it still doesn't quite sit right with me i'm still like working that out but yeah realizing i can add value to people how am i adding value what other videos could i make and usually they're in the form of like how to's or tutorials or kit lists type things that's quite common and it's not kits not something i've really gone into i've done a few tutorials on my editing process and more into the filmmaking aspect and again, learning in public, that's how I see it. So it's me learning through teaching others. And I think if you can teach somebody something, you've learned it to quite a good place. That's the evolve part is probably making money and adding more value as opposed to just telling stories. How much do you know about your audience? Yeah, YouTube's really good, giving you a lot of analytics. So it tells me everything. It's nearly, it's like 90, maybe 95% male which isn't surprising, I don't think. And but I say that, I do get a lot of comments uh, from women, so maybe they're just more active at commenting. They're older, older males, like 40 to 50, which I think, again, fits with the demographic of people that are striving and thriving for adventure and have maybe a bit more time to go in, on bike tours in their vacation time, which, uh, yeah, men, most 30-year-olds are probably just building a family and, 20 year olds are yeah maybe out partying that's very generalization <laughs> there's definitely exceptions to that but that's what youtube tells me as the demographics i've come to think about the type of content that that you make and and maybe even that i make here i call it escapism content yeah and, and i think sometimes that especially at that age where you you maybe hit a little midlife crisis and you're just looking for you know, an escape, you turn to YouTube to see cycling videos or whatever. And uh, maybe that's part of that demographic as well. Yeah, there's I've been having a good few chats with a lot of people I've met recently that are, that are in the early 30s and are deciding, I don't want this life of uh, confinement and this career and salary. And I want to have a bit of freedom. And where like I coined this theme with somebody that it's not a midlife crisis it's an early life crisis opportunity like a crisis opportunity that we're taking I don't know but uh yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there that I want to and I do it myself I listen to to podcasts and escape the moment particularly if it's a monotonous long boring road that's my escape sometimes uh, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of people striving to hit that open road, and this gives them an insight into doing that. How do you decide what videos you're going to make? Do you just say, "Well, I'm going to cycle from here to here," so that's a video, or do you spend more time thinking about and looking at the metrics and trying to figure out what's going to what's going to get more downloads? Yeah, I'm not really metric driven. That's uh, something I wanted to. If I'm going to a place. I think, yeah, for sure. I think my Alaska videos will probably do maybe better than my Japan videos, for example. But I enjoyed and cycled my time in Japan, so I'm not going to rush through those and just bolt them together. I, For time, usually a video, it can be a 10-minute video could be seven days. A 10-minute video could be two days. The good thing with the way I do it is I'm maybe two or three months ahead in real life. So I'm looking back and trying to find a story from what I filmed. And I probably only am filming not even 5% of what I do. There's a lot of what I'm doing that never gets filmed. And yeah, and I think that's really important for my own mental health, well-being and not getting the camera out when I first meet people. I'm still working that out. So what videos do I make? I always make, I try to make a weekly 
video which is about my travels which is like a very uh, highly edited polished vlog is how i see it it's more of a documentary vlog and then i occasionally do live videos live streams so i did one maybe last time three weeks ago i'm planning to do one in the next week do one in the next few days whilst i've got good wi-fi but these live videos are like a game changer for me they uh, allow me to engage with my audience real time and i imagine i'm sat on a stage talking to these people and giving them like some information about what i'm doing or my bike or the setup or the route i'm doing or what i've done and then people ask questions and i get to engage real time and that's what the beauty of youtube which no other platform really has is that live feedback and it's there forever it's not like say instagram or the facebook lives where you can never find somebody's content you could go into my youtube and find content from a year ago quite easily which i quite like what is it that you enjoy least about having a youtube channel I hate having to rely on the internet and having a reliable internet connection and being connected in general. I'm now just cycled through Alaska into Canada and down through Yukon into British Columbia. And there's a lot of that where I'm not connected and I've loved it. I've loved not being connected to anything at all. Having a YouTube channel and not being connected is really difficult and I just, the way I get around it is just by telling people I'm not going to be connected for the next two weeks or 10 days. And my audience, I feel like just used to that. And that's part of what it, what it is. Whereas the seemingly an expectation you need to um, put a video out every week at least. Whereas sometimes I can't do that because I'm cycling from the Arctic Sea down to Fairbanks, for example. What's your favorite part about having a YouTube channel? It's definitely connecting with people in real life. It's, yeah, it's all about their real life interactions, which has happened a number of times now with people that have seen my videos and they've reached out to me. And uh, like as recently as when I was in Alaska, another YouTube uh, creator, he makes videos in his hometown about like dog sledding and fishing. He got in touch with me and invited me to stay with him and his family for a few days that led to me going fishing with with his son-in-law, catching a load of salmon. And like, if it hadn't have been for the YouTube channel, I'd have never have met him and never had this experience where when he meets me, he feels like he knows me and trusts me through the year-long videos I've made. And that's a bit strange at first when someone meets you and they know all about your history that you've put out there. But equally, he then gets to know the actual real full me which will uh isn't edited which i wouldn't say the videos aren't me but it you definitely get a different you get to see somebody in the full flesh so yeah that's my uh my definitely my favorite part is them connecting with people i wanted to talk about patreon for a bit because patreon's something that i've thought about for the pursuit zone podcast i'm, I'm not ready to go there yet but what's, yeah. what's your experience been with with patreon and getting that, your whole thought process so I was in a similar place to where you're you're saying that not ready, and I was I was in two minds, and I got a number of messages from people asking me to do, if you had one, I would support you, and it's that balance of offering something which is of value to people, but equally not just saying fund my journey and give me money for nothing. I really wouldn't feel comfortable with that. So I offer people early access to videos i make some exclusive videos at the higher end levels i have one-on-one -on -one phone calls with people and send them postcards so physical things and these people i don't think are signing up for that stuff they're probably signing up because they feel they can support me and they get by the values and everything i'm trying to tell in my stories and it's been an absolute game changer for the amount of money i'm earning i'm as at today in August, making about $300 a month, which is guaranteed income almost, as long as I keep providing this value. And YouTube doesn't get pay me anywhere near as much as that. And that my average spending in the country on the, on the road is about $300 a month. So I'm at a point now where I'm pretty much breaking even, which is like, it's this crazy magical place where I'm like, oh, I could keep doing this. But again comes a little bit of not offering too much how can you keep offering more and i don't want to get into a place where i feel trapped therefore by um offering people things as such 
Right, right. Yeah, that's always the, the tricky part. You never fully work it out. I think from where I was six months ago when I started it to now, I've come a long way and it definitely can still improve. But uh, yeah, the people, it's just speaking to the people that sign up and just like getting to know them. And I think live videos help me with that because I get to know people's names and uh, and just engaging with them as if it's because, again, like I said, the fact that YouTube for me is, has become a business and it wasn't meant to be. It is having that, oh, I need to treat my customer really well. And it's a really clinical way of thinking about it, but it, it means they are my golden customers that I will give lots of time to. And if you're ready for that, it can work. But it takes yeah, it takes a good bit of time to get to a place where mentally we're ready to do that. Well, Adam, what's next for you? So for me, uh, as I mentioned, I'm cycling the Americas now. So I la- arrived in Alaska cycled so far from the top of Alaska down through Canada. I'm planning to cycle Vancouver Island into Vancouver. And then I've got a loose plan at the moment to maybe cycle across Canada in the winter, which is very different. It's a new challenge and everybody tells me not to do it, that I mention it too. So we will see how that goes. If it starts getting cold, I'll start heading south. And then, yeah, wiggle my way to Argentina. That's the the big plan. And I don't know what route that will take me. But, yeah, um, I've got till January. It's now August, so I've got till January in Canada. Uh, So I'm going to make the most of being here because I'm really enjoying Canada. It's so much to see and it's so beautiful. One of your videos, you mentioned getting to Mexico and then maybe going to Australia. Is that uh, out the window now? (laughs) Yeah, it's a thought I've had, and it was more based financially. I was worried that I'd run out of money, and I've decided to throw myself into the filmmaking. And if I did run out of money, I would have to work. And I think at the moment, Australia would be where I'd choose to work. It'd be a new adventure in a different way, rather than going back to the UK. But today, I don't plan to go to Australia. If I go to Australia, I've probably uh, yeah, run out of money, <laughs> which could happen. <laughs> Hey, it happens. Yeah, and that's good. And if it does, um, I, like everybody else that pays for the, their adventures, you've got to work and then, yeah, work hard and then hopefully enjoy the time you you earn from working. Well, how can people contact you if they want to learn more about what it is that you're doing? I'm most active on Instagram, which is Adam Cycling the World. But I do have a website, which is adamhugill.com. And all my links to my YouTube channel and everything else is on there. But yeah, the best way is probably direct message on Instagram. That's the way that I'm more or less connecting with most people. And I'm on Instagram whenever I get the internet. So yeah. All right, Adam Hugo, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, good luck to you. Continued success on your with your YouTube channel and on the cycling. And be sure to stay safe out there. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you once again for listening. You can find this episode online at thepursuitzone.com slash TPZ181. That's TPZ181. The best way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share this episode with your friends. You can find subscription links at thepursuitzone.com. If you're listening on YouTube, be sure to give this a thumbs up and you can like and follow on Facebook or Twitter. The tags are at the Pursuit Zone. If you want to send me an email, you can write me at paul at the Pursuit Zone.com. You can also leave a voice message through speakpipe.com slash the Pursuit Zone. This episode was recorded on August 15th, 2019. For the show notes and more great adventure travel podcasts, visit the Pursuit Zone.com. <laughs>